Manscaped is here to up your body grooming game. Manscaped has the revolutionary electric trimmer, the Lawnmower 3.0. It's cordless, it's waterproof, and it's guaranteed not to nick or snag your nuts or your chest because you can use it upstairs and downstairs. So go to manscaped.com, use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. I am absolutely thrilled to have a guest on today who is one of the few women that I know who feels all of my pain at the moment. <laughs> and that is Letter the Plug because she is also pretty much exactly just as pregnant as I am. <laughs> Look at that baby bump. That's so cute. <sighs> it's a lot. It's a lot, it's right? Lot carrying around. Are your ribs in any pain yet? So not necessarily in pain, but she does now at the point she's starting to stretch her foot out and she'll push into my ribs sometimes, but she doesn't like leave her foot there. So yeah, just- she's actually, yeah, she's dropped a lot. So now like she's really like pushing on my pelvis and on my bladder. So you have to pee even more often than you already had to. Exactly. Yeah. And like, I don't really have to pee. Like there's nothing... There. Oh yeah. It's like, it, it's just a constant, like, I always feel like I have to go to the bathroom a little bit. Yes. Constantly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then, you know, like I pretty much waddle now, so, <laughs> which I'll, I'll be there soon, which my husband finds hilarious. He will no longer let me say like, Oh, let's go for a walk. It's like, Oh, let's go for a waddle. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, how many weeks are you? I'm 32 weeks. So am I one week behind you? Yeah, I'm yeah. 33 weeks. I know. It's crazy, right? Two little porn set babies. I know. <laughs> I know. I remember um, when I saw you make your announcement, I was like, oh my God, like that's we're exactly the same. I actually reached out to uh, your boyfriend, Adam, because mm-hmm. as you know, uh, I wanted to ask him about like the multi-channel network that I signed with that he's with as well. So I wanted to ask his advice. Mm-hmm. And, um, and he, yeah, mentioned, you know, you guys were really excited and I told him congratulations. And then I was like, God, I should have her on my show because like, you know, we're so close in pregnancy and obviously we work in the same industry and no, have yeah, a lot in common. Yeah. So thank you. So on. thank you for coming. Um, you, so you're a very successful, I know you don't, I don't think you specifically have a podcast, but you have a very successful YouTube channel right? Do you have a podcast? No, I don't have a YouTube channel. I just, I just don't know if it's very successful, but it's, it's popular. Well, I mean, okay. So compared to mine, which is by what I measure all things in life is Uh how well are they doing compared to me? Uh, You are doing really well. How many subscribers do you have right now? I have one and a half million, but yeah, I said I would make a sex tape if I got a million subscribers. So I have a lot of subscribers because of that, but they're not necessarily like my fans. So that's the secret. Yeah. I, I just hit 80,000 and um, I'm really like excited to get to a hundred. Th- I mean, I definitely want to get to a million one day, but it's, it's slow going. So. But the cool thing is that everyone who subscribes to you is subscribed to you because they really want to see your content versus like, I have a ton of subscribers, but there's like a, maybe 10% of them who want to watch my videos, but it's fine. I didn't- you know what though? I don't know because I was actually looking at some of your vlogs where you talk about like your pregnancy journey and mm-hmm. everything. And a lot of your fans seem to be really engaged in your personal life and you seem to have a lot of female fans. Yeah, I actually do. Like in the beginning I didn't, I didn't have a lot of female fans. And then now it's like 50, 50 on some videos. And sometimes depending on the content, like a lot of baby stuff is like 80, 20 for more yeah. girls, which is just unbelievable because my Instagram numbers aren't like that. It's like very heavily male audience. Yeah. My, my statistics on both are pretty much exactly the same. It's like 96% men. Oh, wow. On my Instagram and on my YouTube. Wow. So like my pregnancy. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, my pregnancy vlogs don't get, don't get much, um, attention, but that's okay. 
I mean, men are people are interested in pregnancy. <laughs> no, I mean, honestly, people are here to see, you know, like people like you, like the people that I interview has nothing to do really okay. with me. <laughs> I mean, if anything, so the one feedback I get is like, Holly, shut up. Oh, <laughs> let your talk. I want to hear about you. I don't know much about you. So I'm very curious. Well, about you. <laughs> my favorite subject. <laughs> Just kidding. Well, feel if you have any questions for me, feel f- free to throw them in there. But we are we are here to talk about you, okay, fine, and to complain together about um about our pregnancy. About so, <laughs> yeah, I know, right? So maybe let's uh let's actually let's start with um your pregnancy because I know that you and Adam were trying, mm-hmm. um, and saying that you really wanted. My husband and I were just kind of like we couldn't really make up our mind and decide if if we wanted to go there. So we just kind of left it up to the universe and obviously the universe decided. And I'm significantly older than you. So I clearly waited a long time. And you got pregnant naturally. Yeah. That's awesome. That's the universe wanted you to get pregnant and have a baby. So that's exactly how I feel. And honestly, looking back now, I really feel like for me, this was the best timing because I was able to like have my twenties, have my thirties, build a career, go through all the bullshit that I had to go through, go through like fucking rehab and all that nonsense um so you know i'm finally like in a good place that like it You're feels grown like and wise right now exactly so how was it for you like have you always wanted to have kids or yeah. is this something okay always like I th- when i was a kid i think i was really obsessed with seventh heaven and there's like tons of kids in that family and i was okay. like i want that I don't quite think that I want that anymore. I'm not sure. (laughs) We'll see how many kids I end up having, but I've always wanted kids. I've always like, even, even when I'm just around like a group of girlfriends, like, I feel like I'm constantly like momming everyone. Like, did you, did you get your jacket? Like, is everything okay? Do you need anything? And I've just always had that like motherly instinct in me. And I've, I've always wanted kids. And so last year, On Halloween, Adam and I took his nephew's trick-or-treating and, you know, everyone's out partying and going to go get drunk and whatever. And we're driving home for trick-or-treating at like 7 p.m. And we're like, why aren't we just having babies since we're choosing to be like boring and staying in on Halloween night anyways? And so we're actually due that same week the next year. We're due the week of Halloween. So that's so cool. Yeah. So obviously it's something that it wasn't like a situation where you had to like convince Adam to like have kids. Like he no. wanted them as much as you did. So yeah. you guys were on the same page from the beginning. Yeah. yeah. I think he is the one who brought it up that day. Like, well, why, why don't we, why don't we have kids? I mean, we, we had talked about it before and we had talked about it as something in like a few years sort of thing, mm-hmm. but then it's kind of like, what's really stopping you from doing it now was, was how we felt. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. And how do you feel about being pregnant during, I mean, obviously this COVID thing came up, which nobody foresaw. And how do you feel about being pregnant during quarantine? Do you think like it's an, there's some advantages, some disadvantages? I think, yeah, for sure. Advantages and disadvantages. I mean, I got pregnant in February and I had this plan. I was going to make all this content before I took a few months off, yada, yada, yada. And then pretty, and then March, everyone went into lockdown. So obviously things didn't work out that way, but I'm not happy that there's a pandemic. However, I don't feel like I'm missing out on much during my pregnancy because there is less going on. And so, yeah, I think that's it. That's, that's literally exactly how I feel. It's kind of a, the time where you're supposed to stay home and just take care of yourself and, you know, be mellow. And so what, what better time to be pregnant than that time, I guess. Yeah. I do feel like in a way it is fortunate because, um, I work so much and, Mm -hmm. you know, I work like on set, like as a director and photographer and I'm on my feet and I just, I would have worked all through those early months and just all the stress and everything. Mm -hmm. And so this kind of forced me to slow down, which, I'm not good at doing on my own. So, um, I do feel like in a way it it is a good thing. And same as what you're saying, like, I don't feel like I'm missing out on anything because there's nothing going on. There's not like, I mean, I I was bummed that I didn't get to do some like last travels that I wanted to do. And, Mm -hmm. you know, Adam and I want to go away for a week somewhere, but I'm like, well, I don't really feel comfortable going anywhere. So that's kind of a bummer is not being able to go travel at all, but you know, what can you do? 
Yeah. And you guys are fortunate too, that both of you have careers where you can work like remotely from home and pretty yeah. much always have, right? Yeah. I mean, we've been spending a lot more time together too, like just mm-hmm. because he's been working from home more and I'm at home anyway. So that's another benefit, I guess, of being pregnant during the pandemic. <laughs> yeah. What, um, how do you feel about becoming a mom? Are you scared? Are you excited? Like mixture of both? So I've never been scared to become a mom, but the one thing that is scaring me is that the last, you know, seven months have been so relaxing because there has been less going on and I've had a really, really easy pregnancy, um, slept eight, nine hours a night, every night. And then all of a sudden everything's going to change. And I think that's what I'm scared of is just like the shock and the transition of having my life sort of disrupted because it's been so relaxed. But I mean, it's, it's nothing that scary. I'll have to get used to it. I I know how you feel. I've also had an incredibly easy pregnancy and it had no morning sickness. Mm -hmm. I felt great. I had good energy. Um, I was in a great mood. And then all of a sudden at about seven months, I started to become very uncomfortable Mm -hmm. um, and started to really feel the weight of the pregnancy and like not be able to do the things that I normally do, like not be able to, because we have a Peloton. So I spin at Uh home because like there's so many, you know, like walking is hard now. I went on an hour walk today and it's fucking like your stomach. Well, you have like, to pee as soon as you start walking because it's just bouncing onto your bladder over and I over know. again. I do I the same know. thing with walks and I'm like, okay, we have to go back home. I have to pee. Yeah. Have you tried the matern? Have you gotten a maternity belt? Because I have that, like no. that belt. That- so there's a belt that like holds your belly up. Okay. Um, And that's super helpful. Like I can't go on walks without it. I'm going to have to go on Amazon right after this and get one. Yeah. Yeah. Get- it's like called a belly bra. Belly bra. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm down because- yeah, I have like, I keep toilet paper in my car and my purse. I'm just so scared that I'm going to really have to pee somewhere and be in trouble. <laughs> I, know. I know. I know exactly how you feel. Um, but yeah, it's just started to like take its toll where now like my hips hurt and like my legs have started to ache and, and I'm, and I feel like I can't move as much as I could. And, and I actually did a couple of shoots in the last few months and you know, I just try to do what I normally do, work 12 hours on uh-huh. set and be on my feet all day. And then like, I thought I was going to die afterwards. And I just got really frustrated with myself because I feel feeble. Yeah. And I, it angers me. Do you, do you feel the same? Yeah. Way? It's hard to cut yourself slack. Cause you're like, you know what you're capable of and right. you know, being pregnant is not a handicap. And so when you have any sort of feeling of like, Oh, this is really hard. You kind of try to tell yourself, tell yourself like, no, this is easy. Like everyone does this. I can do this. There's, you know, there's pregnant Olympic weightlifters and all these sort of things. And then I had the same thing where I, I was like on a, I did a six hour shoot day on Saturday. And I swear it took me like two hours, two days to recover. Mm-hmm. I just felt so tired. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. yeah same. And do you have it? Like you seem like you kind of might have like a type A personality, like really strong work ethic. Yeah. I just, I don't know. I don't like to cut myself slack. I'm like, you, you can do this. You've done this before. You can do it again. Yeah. Same. I'm, I'm very much like no excuses, like yeah. stop making excuses, like shut up. Yeah. Stop whining. But you know, like I really do need help getting off the couch now. Yeah. If it was up to my family, I'd be on like bed rest for the whole nine months. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm like driving them crazy. Are you still working out? Um, I work, I mean, my workouts are like nothing like they used to be, but I see my trainer like three times a week. And then I go walking like three or four times a week outside of that. So that's pretty good though. Yeah. I mean, yeah, same. Like I do the Peloton two to three times a week. I go for an hour long walk, um, about twice a week. I have a private yoga instructor that I see once a week. Um, but I, yeah, my workouts are nothing like what they were. And I feel like such, I just feel so weak weak and kind of lazy, but most people don't, a lot of people don't exercise at all when they're pregnant. I mean, I'm doing all the walking because I want my labor to be easy. You know, I I enjoy walking, but it's like a trillion degrees outside. I would rather not walk, but I'm I'm doing it because I'm hoping this baby will just slide right out of me. (laughs) (laughs) So how are you, uh, how do you feel about the labor? I've been taking birthing classes and I feel like 
No, I'm, I, I know, I don't know much about that. Is I that just like when they hypnotize me? And it's like really hippy dippy. And I like, I, I just like couldn't get into it. I had to do like a visualization exercise where like my, I mean, she, my teacher teaches yoga too. So she was like guiding me through a visualization of the day that I was going into labor. And I just like wanted to start bursting out laughing. Like I, I couldn't, I couldn't take it seriously, but I would love to know what classes you're taking because I feel like I need something. So we started taking, <laughs> so I've been taking a birthing class called a uh, supported birth. And so I, I'm very lucky because my sister-in-law who lives in the guest house right behind me. So my sister, and my brother, my sister-in-law, and my brother, um, just had a baby like two and a half months ago. Oh. So I'm literally just doing whatever she did. Yeah. Like I, I've read no books. I've done no research just and I'm just her. like, just ask her. Cause she's one of those like super focus type a like reads everything yeah. all this so i'm just like whatever she says like my doctor is her doctor my pediatrician's going to just do everything that she does that's easy um, that's great so i took these birthing classes which i just finished last week and they were great in the sense that like you know they give you a lot of information like there were so many things about labor that i you, you know in the movies you see like the woman's water breaks and she like jumps Screaming. in the car screaming like the ambulance like the police give her an escort to the hospital it she all happens so it. fast right and then you hear these stories about like i was in labor for 36 hours and you just imagine somebody like screaming for 36 <sighs> hours in the hospital bed right it's not like that at all so like the first stage of labor which can be up for 24 hours is very mild and it's almost just like having period cramps and you can work, you can walk around, you can sleep. sleep. Yeah. yeah. Like it's, it's very, very mild. And so you obviously wait until contractions are closer together and like longer. And then you get into the second stage of labor and then you can go to the hospital. And then generally you're in the hospital for, I mean, it's so different for everybody, but it's, you know, if you can ride out like, a full almost 24 hours at home, then you'll only be at the hospital for like a day or mm -hmm. less than that, something like that. So ideally that's how it would go. Now, of course, if you get induced, which, um, they, they want to do for me because of my advanced age. Mm. Um, cause I'm going to be 42 on Saturday. Okay. And, um, do you know that they call my pregnancy a geriatric pregnancy? What? <laughs> oh my god i know i'm so sorry they're doing that to you because that is i so am very sorry so too fair i was like you don't have a better name they're like yeah so you're in a geriatric pregnancy i'm like fuck off that is so rude <laughs> so rude wow so they're gonna in yeah. so you'll know the day that you're potentially gonna have your baby's birthday because they're gonna induce you Yes. So if I don't give birth by my due date, they will induce me. They will not let women of my age go past my due date. Wow. My So I have a, a doula and a midwife and I'm going to try to do it at home. And mm -hmm. my doula, when she gave me my birthing lesson, said that on average, first time moms go into labor at 41 weeks and five days, mm -hmm. something around yeah. there. So yeah, your first child is generally slower to come mm -hmm. and later. But they don't, they don't want, they won't let you go. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So I will probably get induced, which I don't want, but. I want the baby to come at 37 weeks, right? When it's like full term so that I don't have to push a big head out. <laughs> I know. That's how I feel too. What size is your baby? Uh, on, on that, what to expect app. I think it's like a cantaloupe, but do you mean like in my womb, what size is it right now? Yeah. Like have they, I have haven't done an ultrasound measurement? in like three months because I've been going to a midwife. So I actually don't oh, know. Okay. So okay. I'm going to do one maybe in a couple of weeks just to make sure the baby's uh, not breech, but right. I have no idea. I was a six pound okay. baby. So we'll see how big the baby will be. Yeah. I've been going to the doctor and the last ultrasound they did, they said that she's in the 82 percentile. So she's bigger than 82% of babies. Oh. Yeah. My vagina is never going to be the same. Oh my God. I'm praying for no tearing. Have you started stretching your perineum yet? No. 
Oh, I know. I haven't either. Do you, I have the yeah, oil, I, but do you just massage it? Is that what you're going to do? Yeah. So basically like you stick your fingers in your vagina oh. and then you, like you hook it and you find this spot. It's because it's the place between your anus and okay, your vagina. Okay. It's like the opposite of the G spot. Yeah. And then you just like push it and like stretch it and it's like not comfortable. Oh my goodness. Yeah. But that's supposedly the best thing to do so that um, you don't tear. And then usually while you're giving birth, like the nurse will do that for you. So they'll just finger bang you. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm like, I, I think in the beginning I was really nervous. I started watching a, as many birth videos as I could find on Instagram to kind of oh normalize it, make it seem less foreign, make it seem less scary. And then I'm having my birthing lesson last week and I'm trying, you know, I'm gi- being given all these tools to relax and let go and i'm thinking this is going to be scary as shit and it's going to fucking hurt there's no way i'm going to relax yeah no exactly i yeah we so the birthing classes as great as they've been in you know to get give us information um it's also been like terrifying my husband has enjoyed it more than me because he's like okay he likes to be armed with information Uh you know like he likes to know what's going to happen so he can kind of problem solve I'm more, I think, like an ignorance is bliss in this situation. So I wasn't really freaked out about the labor until I started taking these classes and then learning all the things that could go wrong. And now I'm like, and now I'm just like, I'm totally free. I mean, we've seen some terrible birthing videos. Really? We saw one. Yeah. Like we saw one where this woman was like giving birth at home and then like the baby's head is crowning and she starts screaming. She's like, get it out. Get it out. (laughs) And we were just like, oh no, horrified. <laughs> oh my god! And then, um, and then we did, uh, and then our last birthing class was just this past weekend. And actually, this is funny because my uh, birthing teacher totally outed me. Um, so we're watching like, and it, we were watching like the most graphic birthing video we've ever seen. Like they show the baby coming out and then they show like, the placenta coming out and all the blood that comes uh-huh. with it, which is just like so much. And so our teacher is asking us like, how do you guys feel about, you know, how do you feel about that video? And everyone's like, oh my God, that was like a horror movie. And she's like, Holly, I'm interested to know how you feel. And I was like, and you know, great. I haven't told anyone what I do for a living. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I'm just another woman given birth in this class. Um, and she's like, Holly, I'm interested to know how you are. I'm like, yeah, that was really graphic. That was a lot. She goes, well, I'm surprised that you feel that way because you photograph vaginas for a living. <laughs> it doesn't mean and I was photograph like, organs coming out of them. <laughs> That's what I said. And I was like, well, I mean, they're generally better groomed and better lit. Yeah. And I said, and I also, uh, for the most part, I photograph things going in vaginas, not coming out of vaginas. Yeah. And then there's like this really straight laced lawyer couple that's one that's on there, and they're like, "Do you photograph vaginas for a living?" And I was like, "Okay, <laughs> now this you have is what to say I everything. do. <laughs> now I touch you porn, and yes, that's what I do. So just fucking Google me and satiate your curiosity." Oh my goodness. I love that I your know. teacher did that. Like, well, this shouldn't be weird to you. You did weird stuff already. I know. <laughs> and I never, and I never told her. So she Googled me and, and found out, but it, I mean, at least she waited to the last. She was last waiting for the moment and... where she could finally say, Holly, this yeah. is your expertise. Are you prepared? <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're giving birth. So you're going to a birthing center. You're not going to a hospital. No, I'm going to be at home. You're going to do it at home. Yeah. So for me, I'll have to learn my, my birth lessons will be like, when is the moment that I should call in for help? Because, Mm -hmm. you know, I know that you can have contractions for days and they're still in early labor and you might be one centimeter dilated and Mm -hmm. yada, yada, yada. So I don't want to call my like squad of women over if they're not supposed to be here yet. So yeah. Yeah. So then you definitely, unless something goes wrong and you have to go to the hospital, you're not going to be getting an epidural. You're going to do the full natural birth. Yeah. My mom didn't get an epidural for me and my sister, even though she birthed in the hospital. So I'm trying to like channel her strengths, but yeah, I'm sure I'm going to be regretting it in the moment. (laughs) Well, I mean, 
I don't know. I, again, I think I've been trying to like liken my experience to everybody else's. So I'm like, uh-huh. oh, this person had this experience. So mine oh, will be sorry. like hers. This person this had this experience. That's fine. <laughs> so I'll be like her. Um, and I think we just have to accept the fact that like we're all going to have entirely different experiences mm-hmm. and like whatever experience yours is going to be, the end result is going to be the same. You're going to have a beautiful girl, right? You're having a girl. Yeah, we're all having girls. I know. So crazy. Um, so I want to ask you about how you're feeling about raising a child working in the adult industry, but first we're going to go to a commercial break and then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about her success on OnlyFans and so much more. So hang on guys. We'll be right back. Summer is here and Manscaped is here to help you level up your full body grooming game. Their Lawnmower 3.0 is a revolutionary electric trimmer. It's cordless, it's waterproof, and it is guaranteed not to nick or snag your nuts. And if you want to use it on your chest hair, it actually has different settings so you can get the perfect length, whether or not you're the kind of guy who likes to be a little bearish or maybe actually wants a bare chest, literally. You can get all of this inside the perfect package where you will find the crop preserver, an anti-chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer, as well as the crop reviver, a testy toner that is designed to give you a pep in your step. If you subscribe to the perfect package, you will get a blade refill for your lawnmower trimmer delivered to your door every three months. So what are you waiting for? Make this your best and most hairless summer ever. Go to manscaped.com, use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping. That's manscaped.com, use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping. If you're here, it's probably because you're a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered. Well, that's great because I'm a fan of my podcast too. Now, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a crowdfunding platform that allows people to make contributions on a monthly basis. Because this podcast costs money to make, maybe even more so than others. I'm obsessed with quality. So since the beginning, I have always recorded in a studio, had a professional sound engineer, and recorded professional video. All of these things cost money, as you can imagine. And I also made a pretty scary decision this year to cut down on my directing gigs so that I could focus more on this podcast, which is why I need your help now more than ever. But don't worry, I'm not asking you to give me something for nothing. In exchange for your contributions, I offer so many perks. For example, access to the live streams of all of my interviews, a bonus podcast that I do called My LA Porn Life, Q&As where the stars answer your specific questions, behind the scenes interviews, merchandise such as mugs, shirts, and stickers, access to my private Snapchat, and so much more. You can join for as little as $5 a month and help me change the way the world sees the adult industry and sex work. So take a look around and see everything that I have to offer. I really hope that you'll join and be a part of our little community. All right, so we're back. So Lena, you uh, you are a sex worker. Yes. You work in the adult industry. I do. Um, so how do you feel about becoming a mom in, in the field that you work in? Do you have trepidation about it? Do you have anything you're going to change about how you work? Are you worried about how you're going to talk to your kid about it one day? I think in the beginning, it'll be a lot easier, you know, like when you're before your kids two, they don't tend Mm -hmm. to remember a lot of things, but that being said, it's not like I'm going to shoot at home. So I think that'll be like a big change from the beginning is that, you know, I'll have to hire someone for help and I'll, I'll have to figure out my shoot dates. Like right now I'm really loose or before pregnancy, I was really loose with shooting. If, if a girl wanted to cancel and shoot the next day, it was like a really easy thing for me. But I think when I become a mom in order to keep my affairs in order and my mom life and my work life really separate, I'll have to just be more like on top of my schedule and stuff like that. Um, and I wonder if by the time my kid is like, old enough to talk and ask questions if I'll still be doing this. Cause I mean, from the beginning, I just never thought it would last even two months or three months. I thought 
this is a weird hack. I got really lucky, made all this money for almost no reason. And then, you know, four years later, I'm still doing it. And I still can't believe it sometimes. So who knows what will happen in a couple of years. Uh, But all that being said, I just plan to raise my kid to be really, really open-minded and hope that, you know, this doesn't bother them because Mm -hmm. I mean, I was raised really like a raised around people who are a lot more closed minded than I am. And I still manage to be an open-minded person who, you know, has the opinions that I do. So we'll see. It could backfire. Who knows? (laughs) But I mean, you are the kid of a family in the porn industry, right? So Mm -hmm. how was it for you? Oh, boy, you're going to talk about me. No, yes, saying. please Yay! tell me. I actually don't know any of my answers yet. I haven't figured it out. <laughs> um, you know, I, so my, my yeah, my mom, my, both my parents uh, worked together, directed uh, porn movies. And my mom is mostly known for her photography. Um, she, she Back when you could make money just being a photographer and shooting for the magazines, that's mostly what she did. Mm-hmm. But they did also make some movies um, in like the early 80s which are so hilarious to watch now because they're so <laughs> terrible. Um, my dad like wrote the scripts. There's like so bad. It's so weird. <laughs> that is so cool that you get to see that. So funny. But you know, I think I wasn't raised with a sense of shame about sex. Mm-hmm. So like for me, that wasn't really part of how I saw the world. I think a lot of the stigma that we come up across is from people who were raised to believe that like sex is sinful, sex is dirty, sex can only be one specific way and every other way is bad. And so I think that if you're not raised with that idea about sex, then it won't be weird or dirty or gross to you because, you know, we are like, we are who our parents raise us to be, right? Mm-hmm. And obviously we can become adults and we can change how we see the world and and whatever. But um, that that initial hard wiring that we get as a child, I think really stays with us in, in a lot of ways. So I think that, you know, if you just, if you raise your child with, you know, a happy childhood, you love them, you teach them, you know, good morals, like how to treat other people and how to be respectful and, you know, just to be a good person. Um, and you don't kind of create this whole like drama and mystery and fear around sex. Like your kids aren't going to feel that way because in one question I get a lot is people are like, when did you find out what your parents did for a living? Expecting that I had like this moment of epiphany where it was all revealed and I was so ashamed and, And I don't remember that ever happening because I don't think my parents ever really like tried really hard to hide it. I mean, they Uh obviously didn't necessarily expose it to me. It wasn't like, you know, I came to shoots when they were shooting or they were like, hey, look at this movie mom and dad made. Yeah. Um, I just remember as a kid, you know, growing up, understanding that what mom and dad did was they made movies and pictures for Mm grownups and I wasn't a grownup. So it wasn't a grownup. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't, it was almost like the same thing as like watching like a rated R movie. You know what I mean? Like it was, you know, like these are, these are for grownups. You're too young to Mm -hmm. understand. And you know, generally when you're a kid, you don't give a fuck what your parents do. Do you have memories of like friends not being allowed to come over or like be your friend because their parents didn't like what your parents did? Cause that's kind of the kind of thing that I'm more worried about is like other people, not necessarily my kid. So I don't remember specifically like friends not being allowed to come over and stuff like that, but I do remember having to kind of lie about what my parents did for a living Mm -hmm. and reference something else. So I do remember school, there was specifically one school project where I had to write about what my mom did for a living. It was like parents week or something like that. And like my, my dad had to sit down with me and like help me write out this kind of like sort of lie she's a photographer but she's a photographer but not exactly yeah don't talk about specifically what she does so so that's where the problem arose was was me not being able to really explain to other people what they did for a living and trying to have to hide that from other people Mm -hmm. and then um but in terms of like how I felt about it 
yeah, it just didn't, it wasn't really that important to me. Now, of course, once I hit puberty and I became interested in sex, then, you know, I started to steal the magazines out of the, the <laughs> office. Um, but you know, like I, I feel like I had a really healthy, wonderful child. My parents loved me and they yeah, you know, took us to the beach every weekend and read me a bedtime story every night. And um, spent a lot of time with me and encouraged me and believed in me. And I think that as a parent, like that's all you can really do. That's like and your I, whole job. Yeah. Yeah. Like all this other shit's like not really as important. Yeah. And I think also too, by the time, you know, we're becoming more progressive as time goes along. Mm -hmm. So I think that by the time, you know, your child is old enough to kind of understand what you do for a living, I feel like society will hopefully there'll be like less stigma around it. Yeah. So that's what I'm hoping is too. difficult. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the number one sort of comment I see from people is your kid's going to get bullied in school. Mm -hmm. And I mean, everyone gets bullied in school, but also like why raise your kid to be a bully and like, why accept that of your kid? You know, it's like, you're making a huge assumption there that it's, that that's also okay. And that people shouldn't be taught not to do that either you know it's like I've seen people say like I'm gonna let my kid bully your kid and it's it's like why you're, yeah. you you clearly follow me you're clearly interested in what I do uh so you know but you can't change everyone you can only do your job and your job is to raise your kid to the best of your ability and give them all the things that you wanted when you were growing up and you know what happens happens yeah. And to be fair, like it, it's a lot different now than it was when I was growing up. Cause when I was growing up, there was no internet. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, it's going to, you're going to have more, of, I guess uh, me too. We're going to have more of a challenge because like the internet will allow our children to look up anything. Yeah. I, I think that's something that is going to be interesting because you don't want your kid to find out from a friend at school. You know, mm -hmm. you kind of want to be the first one to tell them, but yeah. what are you going to tell them when they're seven? Yeah. You know? Yeah, right. I know. So, it's like, what's the appropriate age to bring it up? But it's like kids are <laughs> exposed to, are often exposed to porn at such a young age, mm -hmm. but maybe, maybe by then there'll be, I don't know, like there'll be better safeguards in place. Um, there won't be such a proliferation of free porn that's so easily accessible. Yeah. Maybe we would have figured out how to manage it better. You know, is, I mean, technology is changing so drastically all the time and, and society is too. I just kind of, I, I try not to trip out too much on like something that's so far in the future that yeah. I can't change right now anyways. Yeah. So yeah, I don't, I'm not really thinking about it too much right now either. It's like everyone who follows me is thinking about it a lot more than I am. And I'm like, I'll get there when I get there. Yeah. Do you, um, I know that you've gotten like some blowback about like still doing scenes and stuff while pregnant. How do mm -hmm. you feel about that? I mean, I, I stopped caring about what people said about the porn stuff kind of a long time ago. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, but I already knew that that was coming, you know, like I knew even before I got pregnant that I wasn't going to stop working if I got pregnant, unless I was like deathly ill. But I mean, it's not like all about money, but the amount of money that I'd be throwing away if I just decided to quit my job for nine months when I'm perfectly healthy and perfectly energized, it's just, it doesn't make any sense. Like we wouldn't expect the same thing from a woman who works an office job, a lot of women who work in the office will work until the last month of their pregnancy or sometimes even up to their due date. And I get mm -hmm. that my job is like, it's my body and it's physical, but I think I look great. I feel great. So I'm just going to keep working. And I think also to society has this kind of bizarre idea about like, you know, the mother, like the, what is that? Madonna and the whore complex, like mm -hmm. the mother and the whore, like you're only one or the other. Like, yeah. You can't like be if you're sexual a mom, and maternal. Yeah, exactly. If yeah. you're a mom, you can't be sexual. You can't have a sex life. If you're sexual, you can't be a mom and you can't be maternal. And that like women can only be one or two of these things. Whereas of course guys like can do whatever they want, but we have yeah. to be pigeonholed into a very specific role, which I think is really unfair. No, totally. I, 
I mean, it's interesting too, because there's a huge amount of men who think that women who look motherly and look pregnant are really sexy. Cause I mean, yeah. Like if, if men are attracted to like fertility, what's a bigger sign of fertility than already being pregnant? Yeah, exactly. And I mean, you know, it's, it's interesting too, if you want to just look at it from a biological perspective, the reason that our sex drive is one of the strongest drives that we have as human beings next to like, you know, a desire to eat, um, it's to push forward the procreation of the human race. So it's all like entangled in each other. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, like sex leads to, you know, the fertility of a woman and the fertility of a woman is brought on by sex. And it's, so it's like, I mean, really in, in the end, it's this beautiful cycle and, and, you know, sex is, sex is many different things. And, but in the end it's, you know, it's a, it's a incredibly wonderful, intimate experience that can like make a human. Like it's not like we made a person. I still don't believe that until she comes out and I see her because it seems unbelievable and impossible, but we're making humans, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. It's just like, it's an incredibly powerful role that a woman has, you know, being able to, to create life. And I don't know if maybe it's like this patriarchal desire to control, um, you know, that power that makes has made women sexually repressed for centuries, but I think it's a wonderful thing to be able to embrace, break out of that, embrace your sexuality as a woman, embrace your power in that as a woman, and then also embrace your maternal side as a woman and and be able to be both things. Like you can be both things. Yeah. I'm really enjoying like shooting and being so liberal with my body. And, you Mm -hmm. know, before it's all about like, how tiny can I look? And, how, how can I suck my stomach in? And, and everything about what I do right now is the opposite about the, the, of, of that. Like there's no, there's no reason that I should be super tiny. I cannot suck in my stomach no matter how hard I try. Yeah. Um, and I'm kind of enjoying that because I've never had that much freedom with my body before. I've always just been like watching how I appear all the time. And this is like, can allow myself to just look and be the way I am in my natural state. Yeah, I know how you feel. It's actually wonderful because it's the first time that I'm like, I'm pushing my belly out, like trying to make it look larger. Mm-hmm. Normally you're trying to suck it in. So it is a welcome change. That's for sure. Yeah. I had a couple of photo shoots and I was like, oh my God, I could eat whatever I want before the photo shoot. This is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think, um, what do you think is going to be the easiest thing for you and the most difficult thing for you as a mother? I think, I feel like the hardest thing is going to be trying to figure out how to balance this all because I'm, I think that once the baby's here, I'm going to become all mom and like kind of ignore my business, but the business must go on. Um, So I think that like learning how to balance the two is going to be the hardest thing and like letting go and letting someone else take care of the baby. Um, what's going to be easy? God, I've never really thought about that because I think it's just going to be such a big adjustment, but. Or what do you think you're going to be the best at as a mom? Mm. Maybe it's a better way to phrase it. I don't know. I just know, like, I I know how how I am with Adam and I like know all his cues so well when he's like needs something. And I feel like that's probably going to be how I am with the baby. So that like reading the baby's cues and the baby's needs and wants will hopefully be the easiest thing for me. So like a very, you'll be a very intuitive mother. Yeah, I think so. And then same question about Adam. What do you think is going to be the hardest for th- thing for him as a father? Or maybe like, what's he going to be the worst at? And then what do you think he's going to be the best at? I think he's going to be the best at making her laugh for sure. Cause he's just such a goofball. But I think everything is going to be brand new for him and he's going to learn so much because he, he decided he wanted kids once he met his nephews and he, you know, they lived on the East coast. So he didn't get to meet them until they were not 
newborns anymore. They were more babies. They were a little bit older. And so he hasn't really been around a newborn. And I don't think he knows how much attention they need and how easily they wake up. Cause he's just like a noisy gets out of bed kind of guy makes a lot of noise. And I think that like, there's gonna be so many little adjustments that he's going to have to make and realize like, okay, it's all about this, this little thing that just cries all the time right now. Mm -hmm. What is he the most afraid of? Afraid of? Is he even afraid of nothing? About- <laughs> I think that he, he probably feels the same way about the balance thing. Like he has so many things that he wants to do in his personal life and his business life. And he has all these interests and he wants to do way more. And I think for him, it's going to be figuring out like, okay, how do I balance my time so that I could be the best dad, the best businessman, you know, the best, just all these different facets of his life. Yeah. You want to know what like my husband's greatest fear is? What is it? Is that I'm going to die in labor. In labor. Okay. I sometimes worry about that, even though it's totally stupid because and I was like, that never entered my mind until you said that thing's Why a lot. Why he do that to you? I'm like, I'm not going to fucking die. Like, You're going to have one contraction and he's going to be like, it's it's happening. He's, he's going to start freaking out. <laughs> he does do that. Like even when I like get up, you know, like in the middle of the night, I get up to pee or I have to like roll over in bed because, you know, it's hard to get comfortable. He'll be like, he'll wake up and be like, are you okay? Do you need anything? Are you okay? I'm like, I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> Just, you know, I'm good. I like, I just have to pee. Like I have to pee like five times a night. Like you Adam needs a little bit of that. Adam thinks I'm totally fine all the time. I'm like, Hey, can you help me carry this like really heavy thing? He's like, Oh yeah. Yeah. I got you. Like he just like forgets that I'm pregnant sometimes. I think it was like that for him at the beginning because I am very like independent and I'm, I'm pretty strong and uh-huh. I never really asked for his help with stuff. But then like once I started to become noticeably like slowing down and, and stuff like he started to realize that like. He okay, really she needs, needs help. To. <laughs> yeah, she really needs help. And it, it's weird too because his like best fr- all of his best friends, like literally four of his closest friends all had babies in the last like six months. It's really bizarre. Oh wow. So I think they've all been telling him, like, okay, you know, this is what your wife's gonna need and that kind of stuff. So but uh yeah, I've definitely noticed like a marked change in in how he is towards me now. How how lucky is it that we don't feel super emotional because I feel like people talk about that a lot. Yeah. And even a couple of Adam's friends who already have kids have asked him like, Hey, are you guys like having any crazy fights? And I don't know if it's the happy hormones or what, but I feel like very even keeled. And I feel mm-hmm. like our relationship's never been better. So yeah. I don't know. Everything everyone told me about pregnancy doesn't happen to be true yet. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. He definitely, you know, got warned about like the pregnancy hormones and, you know, the over emotionality and, and, you know, like my sister-in-law, like I said, I would see her a lot and I would walk in sometimes and she'd just be crying. And I'm like, what's wrong? She's like, I don't know. And I've had none of that. Like I had one, like kind of, I've had like two, like kind of emotional moments and they Uh were both like, because I just was so frustrated with my inability to like Uh do something physically. Um, so, but yeah, no, I've had like, I haven't really had any emotional mood swings and I feel really fortunate. I feel very rational and logical. Same. I feel great. Same. I just (laughs) think we're just really good at this. Yeah. We're we're built for this. Okay. So um, let's uh, shift gears. We've we've been talking about pregnancy pregnancy for like 45 45 minutes. minutes. Yeah. All of my male listeners have fucking logged off by now. Yeah. They're like, Um, bye. Let's talk about, let's talk about OnlyFans. Actually, let's talk about how you got into what you're doing now, because you didn't really ever do like mainstream porn. You've kind of always been a solo independent content producer, which is kind of like the ultimate dream for most uh, sex workers now. So tell me about your journey on how you got to where you are today. Um, I mean, I started posting like bikini photos on Instagram and they started getting some traction. I think back when I started doing this was like 2016. And I think it was a lot easier to like get on the Explorer page just for looking cute. I mean, you could still do that, but it's a lot harder as like a sex worker because you get shadow banned and whatever. But back then, um, I just started getting followers and I didn't have like, like a lot or anything. I had maybe like 20,000 or something, but people started asking me about 
my private Snapchat. What's your private Snapchat? And I was like, what the hell is a private Snapchat? I used to call it chat snap for so long. I didn't even know how to say it right. I when, like was a really it? late bloomer to social media. When, like, when is this? Like people are at, cause the private Snapchat thing, I feel sort of new. Mm, I was or doing it in 2016. Not. So, okay, so like four years ago. Okay. I was doing it like I, I had my own website built so that I could sell my private Snapchat on it because I there, I didn't know about like Fan Centro and all the other ones where you can sell your Snapchat on back then. But um, yeah, I was really late to social media. Like after co- it was like a year after college that I got social media. So um, yeah, I, I mean, people just kept asking me what my private Snapchat was, and eventually I just like gave in because it. I was looking at the numbers and I was, you know pretty, pretty positive that I was going to be financially successful at it. And I was really miserable at my job. So I just decided to start it and I did really well my first month. And I, and I was like excited, but also really nervous. Didn't want to do anything with my money because I was like, there's no way this is going to keep happening. You know, this is like a weird life hack and I've just gotten really lucky and I got to start saving all this money because it just doesn't make any sense. So what did you start doing? Like, were you just posting nudes or like, were you starting to do sex scenes? Like, what was that first step that you made? Oh, it was like a couple photos of my old boobs in the bath. Like very mild, very, um, I was really like nervous. I didn't talk that much. I just like kind of would play music and make little cute videos of my body. And that was pretty much it back then. I didn't even really consider that you could like work with other people and film it at the time I did, I did that for like a long while. Um, and then I started dating Adam and as soon as like the first night him and I hooked up, we just were like filming each other. We just thought it was hot. Um, and so I think that's probably how I got into the, the idea of like shooting with other people and filming with other people was just cause him and I were doing it in our personal life. And yeah. And then I had like a threesome with a girl and like him and like that was really successful. And that that's like a year later. But then, then I realized, okay, like this is the thing to do is to like make videos with other people. This is what people really like to see. And like, I, I had a girlfriend in college. Like I was always into, you know, trying new things and just like, I was into women too. So for me, it just kind of came naturally to like work with other women mm-hmm. and you know, then, then from, from Snapchat, came only fans because sna- people snapchat kept getting deleted all the time so i just kind of like evolved in that sense kind of went with what platform made more sense for me mm-hmm. and i feel like i would hear a lot of bad things about only fans so i didn't join earlier but i'm really upset that i didn't join earlier because i'm like the platform's a lot easier to use than snapchat because you have to like upload content every 24 hours. Yeah. I can't, I'm so bad at my Snapchat. And I would get so, I would get deleted all, I've been deleted like 10, 20 times. I mean, my, my original Snapchat had like over 600,000 viewers. And you know, when you lose that and it's hard to rebuild, you kind of just feel Mm -hmm. like very defeated. But so I'm, I'm very grateful to have like a platform that I can use that I'm not constantly worrying about getting shut down on. Yeah. This is, yeah, I mean, if it took, I guess I started my OnlyFans like last September. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. And then, and it's been obviously really successful for you. Yeah, I mean, I'm enjoying it, honestly. I'm like so happy that I can have this backlog of all of the content I've made in the last four years and just upload my new content, but also like take a day off and not worry about uploading something new because it's not going to disappear. Yeah. That's, that's the thing that's really frustrating about Snapchat. Cause for me, I'm definitely like a scheduling person. I like to sit down, spend an hour, schedule out a bunch of shit and then like not have to worry about it. Yeah. I do, I do find it annoying that you can't schedule DMS on OnlyFans. That you can. irritates me. Can you? Yeah. You can schedule messages. It's a new feature. I would say it's like, like less than a month old. <laughs> I can show you after I can text. Yeah. Them. Cause I'm after. like, yeah, because that would be amazing. Because also, yeah. too, just like I'm trying to schedule everything in anticipation of the baby. Because when I the know. baby comes, like I expect to be able to do nothing. Well, they um, do sleep. I've heard. Hopefully, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But then you have to sleep because apparently the only time you get to sleep is when they it's sleep. When they sleep. That's not happening. So, <laughs> I don't are know you a good? Sleep. Are you a good napper? Terrible napper. 
If See, the sun the is up, napper. I can't yeah, I can't sleep. I'm all I'm the I'm the queen of the naps. Oh, I'm I'm just gonna nap all the I time. Envy you. Yeah, it's 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 a good skill to have, I have to admit. This is actually the first time that it's ever um been something that might be like beneficial and, and come in handy. My husband's the same. We're both nappers. So oh, I'm, we're I'm like, like, give me that extra cup of coffee. <laughs> I just pushed through. <laughs> So, um, and I know you've done videos, like kind of, uh, giving tips about OnlyFans. So what, what would be some of like your biggest tips for somebody new who's looking to get on the platform? Somebody new. So I made that video because when I came on to OnlyFans, um, I didn't, I, I couldn't figure out the platform. It's confusing. Like even now there's like a feature that you're not aware of, you know, yeah, because it's like, it, you really have to like go and explore the platform to figure things out. But, um, that video that I made mostly talks about like making the welcome message and like what kind of services you can offer. And I always give the, the caution of like, you know, if you're, if you, if you're new and you want to start an only fans, like don't just like think about it for a long time because it's kind of a big decision depending on what kind of content you're going to do. Like I started, I had my, my, I mean, my family only found my Instagram when they were mad back in the day, you know, it's like, they didn't talk to me for like, between six months and a year. So I feel like almost every new creator who decides that they're going to do this goes through that sort of period. Mm -hmm. So my biggest piece of advice is like, you know, really think about it. Think about like, if you're okay with your family finding out and like, think about like why you want to do it. Like, do you think you're going to want to do it just because you, you think it's easy money because it's really not like you only make money when you make new content. And so you constantly have to be making new content using your body. Is that something you're comfortable with? Is that something that you want to do? And in the beginning, I didn't really think about it that way. It just kind of evolved and progressed from, you know, me taking a bikini photo on Instagram into me doing, you know, like real porn type content with other performers. But yeah, I thought that's my, probably my biggest piece of advice is if you're, if you're new is just like really, Think about how you want to spend your days. And if you do want to spend your days taking a bunch of photos of yourself and scheduling all your content. And like, that's what you like, cause you have to sign up for like a real, it's like kind of like a real job. It takes as much time as it sometimes. Yeah. I think that's a big mistake that a lot of girls make is that they think that, especially now, like in this OnlyFans gold rush that we're experiencing yeah, that you can just jump on the platform and all of a sudden you're going to be making millions of dollars and it's, it's, that's not true. The platform's super flooded. Mm -hmm. Um, you have to have a pretty decent social media following. Yeah. I would think even then to push your, to push people there. And yeah, it's a lot of work. You got to interact with your fans. Almost um, all of my DMS are, I made an only fans, but I have no subscribers. Can you please help me? Like yeah, almost every single one of my messages. So, you know, it looks like a get rich quick scheme, but it's not. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's work just like everything else. Yeah. So, um, unless of course you're Bella Thorne and you've uh, signed up and then you've made a million dollars, 24 hours. I just can't believe that she said <laughs> that. Like, I don't, I don't see the point of telling everyone how much money you made in a pandemic when there's like over 50 million people without jobs. Yeah, it is. It does seem to feel a little bit, uh, like showboating. But she's and, not the only one who's done it. Like a lot of people join OnlyFans and I guess they're also shocked about how much money they can make and they yeah. put it out there, but I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. It does feel a little bit unfair. I mean, it got her all the headlines, but then of course, for those of you who aren't aware and if you aren't, I'm surprised because it's fucking all over the news. Um, so Bella made a million dollars in 24 hours, supposedly on her OnlyFans, but she did it by misleading people we will say into the kind of content that she was selling she was selling a picture for two hundred dollars which was a locked photo so you can't see it unless you pay for it mm -hmm. and she said that it was a nude photo and um turns out it was nude technically but it was implied nude which is not what people were expecting so what happened was a lot of people charged their money back and, um, the problem with chargebacks is that it's actually really bad for credit card processors. A lot of websites go through a lot of lengths to avoid chargebacks. Um, because if you get a ton of chargebacks, Visa or MasterCard can pull your account. 
And that is absolutely devastating for a website because that's your payment processor. Um, I think American Express is not accepted on OnlyFans. I think they they pulled out. So mm. so if you lose your Visa and your MasterCard accounts, it's a huge problem. So chargebacks are a big issue for websites. So supposedly OnlyFans immediately put a cap on how much people were allowed to charge for messages or get tipped, which interfered with a lot of other sex workers and how much they were charging for special custom videos and things like that. But um, I, I, I try not to, I try to like sit back and kind of wait for the information to come out Mm -hmm. rather than like jump to conclusions immediately. So I've just been kind of like watching what, what's happening. And supposedly OnlyFans is saying that this cap that they put on is temporary and it's not specifically due to Bella. Is that I kind of wonder if they were like planning on doing this and then they kind of just did it at, at a bad time. Mm. Um, I I am a little bit surprised that there isn't a cap on there because that is something that a lot of websites would do simply to avoid the charge back. Yeah. Any sort of issues. Um, I mean, I, I got in trouble for speaking on it, but I spoke on it like before the stuff about this fake documentary came out and the Mm -hmm. stuff about her scamming came out. I just think that like any, I mean, it's, it's, obviously the, the, the platform is flooded with sex workers, but it's not, it's not a, it's not a porn platform. It's like a platform Mm -hmm. for any influencer to sell privatized social media content to their fans. And so I kind of was commenting on the sort of territorialism that was going on about the platform, Mm. because I think the more people who have OnlyFans accounts, the better it is because it just see like a lot of the problems that I had with my private Snapchat website was like, is this a scam? Is, am I going to get like, what's going to be written on my credit card statement, you know? And Mm. so the more well known a website becomes and the most more trusted a website becomes, I think it could be better for every user on the platform. And I don't think that Bella Thorne having an OnlyFans takes away from me having an OnlyFans because we're com- we're selling completely different products to completely mm-hmm. different people, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it's just it's just of course when you're misrepresenting what you're selling. Yeah, and that's, that's never okay. Never. That's never right, right. okay. Um but yeah, I mean, I wonder if like this really, it, the changes really are because of her or if they are just what they were going to already do, like as a safety mm-hmm. precaution for the website. But um, I mean, I'm still of the opinion that any any in- big influencer who wants to join the platform should join the platform and I welcome mm-hmm. them. I just don't think that anyone should scam, obviously. And I think that yeah. people just because I was in support of her joining took it to mean that I was in support of her scamming, which I wasn't. And I, and I commented that like days before all the other stuff came out, she could have joined and never said anything about a documentary. It wouldn't have mattered. You yeah. know, it just, she didn't have right. to say all that. Right. Yeah. That was a little bit. Weird, and she could have also too. just like not said, she could have, she could have actually sent a nude photo or just said, I'm not doing nude at all and charged less for her photos and yeah. not told everyone how much she makes, which could just seems like tasteless. Yeah. 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 Kind of, it seems, it feels like she definitely went about it the wrong way. I think that like what a lot of people's concern is in the community. And I totally, totally understand this is just that like, there's a history of like sex workers getting on a specific platform generating a lot of traffic because of who they are, because of like the public's interest in it and then being pushed off of that platform. Once that platform has reached a certain level where they have a lot of like mainstream traffic, or maybe they have stockholders that have come in and they want nothing to do with porn Mm -hmm. anymore, you know, Tumblr, I mean, Instagram really, uh, Snapchat, all of those things. And I think that like in this pandemic, especially OnlyFans has become this incredible resource for all of these sex workers to become independent and to be able to make their own money and finally feel like they have some financial freedom and they have hope for their career and their future and they don't have to slave and they don't have to work for companies they don't want to work for anymore. So I think it felt like it was this amazing gift they've been given and then it's been like snatched away and that they might lose it like they've lost these other platforms. I mean, you talked about, you know, your Snapchat getting deleted like 10 times. 
And I'm not sure if that's going to happen, but I can totally understand everybody's trepidation with that. Yeah, I understand everyone's fear around that. I mean, I don't think Snapchat was, Snapchat was never approving of porn being on their platform. It was all done low key, like, you know, breaking the rules sort of thing. I do get that, you know, I have a deal, I have the problem where I get deleted off um, or things removed from my Instagram all the time before back when I first started my Instagram page, I would get my page shut down multiple times a year. So I understand the concern there. I don't, I mean, I think that, I don't think that we're really ever going to be pushed off of OnlyFans, but I don't think that OnlyFans is going to promote itself as a sex worker platform, even if sex workers built it. Yeah, that's true. You know, you're right, actually, because when you, when you think about it, if you look at the terms of service on Snapchat, I think it specifically says like, no, it's completely illegal by their terms. Yeah. And then on OnlyFans, they have like a list of like, what is okay to post? No peeing, no pooping. Yeah. But like, I can't even type in the word choke. Like there are specific rules for things that you can do and cannot do. You know, you can't use the word diapers on there either. You can't use the word lactate, but diapers is weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah, diapers. Because people, because people are like, oh, pedophilia. I get, I guess so. Um, Anything, any words associated with a baby, maybe are just like a no go. Yeah, yeah. Um, So yeah, you're right. But uh, so I, I, I hope, and I would think. I mean, look, like OnlyFans is. Let's let's be serious. OnlyFans is making most of their fucking money off of sex workers. Absolutely. So if they, you know, even. If you just want to look at them as like some greedy corporate entity, like they're not going to drop their main source of income. But I can totally understand like people's fear around that. And, you know, like just in general, the, the, the adult work community has been, has been so like stigmatized and marginalized and pushed off this platform and pushed off that platform. Mm -hmm. I can totally understand everyone's concerns around it. But you're right. I just don't ever want. Platform. I just don't ever want anyone to think like, "Oh, Holly Randall has the OnlyFans, therefore my OnlyFans will suffer." And and because I feel right. like there's so much already so much competition between girls and between women, and I don't want that narrative to be pushed because we're not selling. Big, we're totally different products, if you want to call us that. You know, yeah. it's like someone who's a fan of you is not necessarily subscribing to you and not going to subscribe they're not going to subscribe because they're not necessarily fans of me and so mm-hmm. it's not like like i saw someone trying to make the argument of like well people have limited money if, and if they're spending it on bella thorne then we're losing and it's like they're not here for you they're here for bella like it's just totally different audiences you know it's a fan driven website there's no explorer page no home page it's all about who's already following you on your specific platform yeah, no, I totally, um, I absolutely see your point and, and I agree with you. And I see everybody's, everybody's point. I think it's just, you know, one of those situations where there's this unwelcome sudden change in people's income that they really depend on. And it's just, it's scary, you know, it's scary the idea of having that, you know, that taken away from you, especially in like these horribly uncertain times when, mm-hmm. you know, most people have lost their jobs and, and we don't know, wh- we don't know what the fuck is happening in the world. You know, like everything's very uncertain. Yeah. And everything's scary right now. And, and it's just an unprecedented time. So, so I understand everybody's fear and panic and I, I totally get all sides. So, um, but it's also a wonderful time for, for us. Me and you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because we get to, we get to bring these beautiful lives into the world. So thank you so much for coming on. It was such a pleasure to have you. Thank you. I can't wait to see um, your baby pictures and then know that mine's coming out like the next week. <laughs> and it, well, you never know. I mean, it's so funny. You know, people's like, your due date's only a guess. So yeah. you could actually give birth before me. I mean, that's true. You know, that could definitely happen. So, well, I wish you the best of luck. Um, you are a brave woman for doing a home birth. I considered it, but then apparently, as a geriatric pregnancy, <sighs> I was advised against it. <laughs> I'm petitioning for a new terminology to be like used in the medical industry for your type of birth because that's unfair. Yeah, it would be. You know, it makes me feel like I'm 80. Like, You're not. <laughs> I know. I mean, I'm halfway there, but I'm not there yet. Uh, so, just in case people don't already know, Lena, where can they find you online? 
Um, I'm at Lena the plug on Twitter and Instagram and YouTube. And if you want to see my only fans or anything like that, all the links for that are usually on my Twitter. Fantastic. And you guys can find me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. And if you want to support this podcast, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall unfiltered. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Lena, again for your time. Thank you. And we'll see you guys next time. Bye. Manscaped is here to up your body grooming game. Their Lawnmower 3.0 is a revolutionary electric trimmer that will not only not nick or snag your nuts, but can also be used on your chest hair. If you get it in the Perfect Package 3.0, it will come with a bunch of liquid formulas to keep you feeling and smelling fresh all day. And for a limited time, you can also get a free travel bag and anti-chafing boxer briefs that come with it. So go to manscaped.com, use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping.